We should reflect that before an era of mass transportation and much less internet access, people assembled physically. The parish church was the most important social and political as well as religious center of any town. Even in cities, people grouped around neighborhood churches. The prestige of the wealthy rested on their support of the building and its clergy, as well as social services for the poor and the ill. Education, moral example, and artistic inspiration were all linked to the church where baptisms, marriages, and funerals marked the passage of life. The importance of the parish church of Folville is masked by the town's present rural simplicity. In the late Middle Ages and the Renaissance, Folville was the seat of a powerful noble family that served French kings with distinction. In 1477, Louis XI endowed Raoul de Lannoy with the territory. Charles VIII made him administrator of the city of Amiens, some 20 miles to the north. And in 1507, Louis XII entrusted Lannoy with governance of the Italian port city of Genoa. As in other churches of the time, Folville is divided into an area on the east for the clergy called the choir, and on the west, the nave, the space of lay parishioners. The different architectural forms of these spaces reflect the increase in prestige of local nobility at a time when building marked status. The original church was erected between 1388 and 1401 to serve as the stage on the pilgrimage route across France to the great shrine of St. James of Compostela in northern Spain. Reflecting on this history, UNESCO designated Folville as a World Patrimony Site in 1998. Raoul de Lannoy began to enlarge the choir in 1512. His testament specified his purpose. He wished to be buried in the chapel that he was adding to the parish church dedicated to St. James. Before his death in 1513, Raoul had already acquired a superb marble tomb from the Genoese sculptor Antonio della Porta and his nephew Pace Gagini. Within the next 10 years, his widow, Jean de la Poix and his son Francois completed the chapel, integrating the classic Italianette designs within a French Gothic setting. The Italian work in marble shows the couple richly dressed and laid out for burial. The side of the tomb displays the Lenoy coat of arms flanked by mourning putti. The French reliefs included Renaissance grotesques and intertwining foliage. Over the couple's head is a pieta, the Virgin holding the dead Christ in her arms, and at their feet the beheading of John the Baptist. On the far wall, we see Saint Anthony, protector against illness. We also find Saint Sebastian, patron saint of archers, and Saint Eligius, patron of armorers. The exterior wall terminates in an elaborate Gothic frame where angels pull back a curtain to reveal the Virgin set within a circlet of the rosary. In 1550, Francois added a tomb for himself and his wife, Marie de Angus, by Florence Crozet. The Lenoy coat of arms is set behind Francois. Below the kneeling couple, a base displays female personifications of the important virtues of justice, prudence, temperance, and fortitude. The choir ensemble is viewed today as one of the most impressive works of Renaissance sculpture of its era in France. The church was originally provided with a choir screen that separated choir and nave. It was removed probably in 1840 when massive structural renovations to the building became necessary. Choir screens were once standard elements of churches and operated as a place of intersection and exchange. Parishes were busy, colorful, image redolent, and even noisy places. Hearing the liturgy was in many ways as vital as viewing and the voices of the clergy swept over architectural divides. Reconstruction suggests that Fulville's screen, like many others, had sculpture to the left and right of a broad arch through which the laity could see the choir and the tombs of the manorial family. An upper level served as platform with a life-size image of the crucified Christ flanked by the Virgin and St. John. Beyond the screen, the stained glass window of the crucifixion draws the viewer's eyes. Its message is personal, stressing the promise of salvation to all. On Christ's right, 
The good thief asks for forgiveness, and Christ assures him that on that very day, he will be with him in paradise. Below the thief, we find Christ's followers who witness his sacrifice. St. John the Evangelist supports the Virgin Mary, who is overcome with grief. The original program included a life-size entombment sculpture, at that time quite common in churches. Christ is laid on a tomb slab. Joseph of Arimathea stands at his head, holding Christ's crown of thorns and the nails that pierced his hands and feet. Across from him, Nicodemus holds the sponge that was used to offer Christ's drink. Mary Salome, John comforting the Virgin Mary, Mary of Bethany, and Mary Magdalene face the spectator. In 1634, Pierre de Gondi transferred the entombment to the parish church of the town of Joigny in Burgundy, as he had sold his domain at Fulville to another noble family. A Gothic arch over the now empty niche displays Mary Magdalene's encounter with the resurrected Christ, and to the left and right, angels display the signs of the Passion. The viewer is asked to meditate on the column where Christ was scourged, the nails, the cross, the crown of thorns, and the spear that pierced his side. The ensemble exemplifies the piety of the time, endeavoring to engage the individual and to encourage empathy. Christ becomes our brother and the Virgin our mother, enduring pain and even death in order to better the lives of others. The spectator is called not only to be comforted, but to follow Christ's example. The roof of the original choir was most probably a wooden barrel vault, similar to that of the nave. A tribute to the artistic ambitions of the Lenoy family, the choir's present stone vault exemplifies France's great expression of flamboyant Gothic. The family envisioned extending the vaulting throughout the nave, but discovered that the original walls were inadequate to support the weight of stone. Instead, the wood was repaired and embellished. In 1869, the parish added a four-part window to the right of the choir. It depicts the life of St. Vincent de Paul. Starting from the left, Vincent hears the confession of a dying man in the nearby village of Gann. The man later received the noble Madame de Gandhi and spoke to her of the comfort provided by Vincent's ministry. The conversion of St. Paul that follows commemorates the fact that Vincent's famous sermon took place on the feast day of St. Paul's vision and subsequent service to Christ's mission. On the right, we see Vincent's groundbreaking sermon of January 25, 1617, in the church at Fulville. Madame de Gandhi and her family are in the foreground. The Gandhi family was a catalyst that enabled the saint to begin his mission to the poor. In the back, we see the artist's reconstruction of Fulville's lost choir screen. The final image shows Vincent teaching the three young children of the Gandhi family. The inscriptions in the windows commemorate papal approval of Vincent's Daughters of Charity in 1633 and the Congregation of the Mission in 1635. 